We're here at the Nixon Library in Yorba Linda uh, on the eve of President Nixon's 97th birthday, and we've just completed the first of a uh, year-long series of uh, Nixon Domestic Legacy Forums, which will mark the 20th anniversary of the library. And John Whitaker, uh, who was the Associate Director of the uh, Domestic Council for Environmental Concerns, uh, has a long backstory with Nixon, uh, going back to what the '60 campaign or be yes, before. Yes, I was involved in 1960 with him when he ran against Jack Kennedy. Do you remember your first meeting with him? Well, yes, I was in Kansas City uh, doing an advance, taught by Bob Haldeman, and I just had a brief handshake with him on the plane, going back. I wasn't particularly impressed by the speech he made. So I was thinking about when I got off the plane, how to go back to my boss and say, well, I really want to take time off from the campaign. But on the way back, there was a guy from the New York Times and a guy from CBS. And I'm a geologist by profession. And Nixon was talking about the, one of the big issues of the day, which was underground nuclear testing and whether we could hear the Russian, whether the Russians were cheating or method of verification for disarmament. And I knew darn well I knew more about seismology than this guy, even if he was the vice president of the United States. But he never made a mistake. It would be like I was a doctor, and you would pretend you were, and you'd talk about taking your appendix out. Somewhere along the line, I'd make a mistake. He never made a mistake. I got off that plane, and I was a convert from there on in. And then you, uh, in the, the uh, wilderness years, after between the uh, 60 campaign and then the uh, California gubernatorial campaign, essentially 62 to 68, uh, you were with him a great deal and traveled with him and sometimes alone. Uh, yes, those. there were four or five of us uh, who would, uh, Nixon's pattern, uh, political pattern then was to take off on a Thursday night and go out from his law firm or, or, or get out for a Friday night fundraising dinner, do another thing on Saturday, even do one on Sunday morning and fly back. He would do that maybe once a month or maybe twice a month. And there were four or five of us. One of us would travel with him during that period. So during that period, we did everything from fend off guests, answer the phone, take care of his laundry if we had to. You know, we, we lived with him completely. And that's when I really got to know him. That was well after this Jack Kennedy campaign. And then in the White House, what was your portfolio? Well, I was first cabinet secretary, and then I did a trip around the world setting up, dropping off uh, Secret Service advance men and uh, White House communication people in each town. We got the astronauts back from the moon. That was interesting scheduling. Nixon leaves Washington, astronauts leave moon, and to meet in the, meet Pacific, in the middle, right? meet in the Pacific together. Then when I came back from that, I went on the domestic council and uh, took over the environment issue, which was then rising up as a big, big time issue in the White House. Uh, you were describing the events of the first Earth Day and the, uh, uh, the, the question of why at that time, in that place and at that time, had the environment bubbled to the surface so suddenly and, and I guess even after all these years you've decided inexplicably. That's right. I, I don't, I've never heard a, a, an explanation that's complete. One of them is, of course, that Rachel Carlson had written the Silent Spring book, and that had gotten into the minds. The other was it was an age of affluency, which might have included civil rights, things that there weren't the, the bread and butter issues of what we do day by day. The economy was getting so much better that people could afford to spend time just thinking about other issues. The, uh, the media was very pro-environment and talked about it and was fascinated by it, but I've never really explain how in a couple of months, 1% of the people thought it was important, and six months later, 25% of the people in the country thought it was important. It was right behind the Cold War and jobs as far as a uh, poll, poll strength. And you talked about the, uh, the administration's, the president's uh, reaction or non-reaction uh, to Earth Day, the first Earth Day, which is the anniversary of which is coming up uh, in a couple of months in April. Uh, why, uh, why didn't he react, and what was the reaction to his non-reaction? Well, he, he first of all, he, the, uh, he felt it was a bit grandstanding just to do a proclamation. Uh, he also worried a lot about the costs, 
But behind all that, the costs of an environment, which nobody was talking about then. Everybody was going to fix the world, clean the air, nobody was saying what anything cost. And that was going on. But he, he, uh, he also kind of intellectually was, what the heck, I, just a few months ago I sent a 37-point message to Congress and there's plenty to do down there. Why is everybody just out making speeches? Why don't we just get it done? But that, because he didn't go out front like that on that, he got quite a lot of negative press that weekend from it. And um, he didn't seem to mind it, but uh, that's, that's the way it was. What uh, you then subsequently wrote a book about Nixon and Ford uh, administration right. energy policy. Right. Uh, looking back, what do you uh, what what do you see as the legacy of the in in, in terms of environmental policy uh, right. of the administration? Well, in terms of historically comparing him with other presidents, is probably he and Theodore Roosevelt would be the two famous presidents that dealt with the environment. I would put him strictly in Roosevelt's class, if not ahead of him. Although, I, you know, there were different kinds of issues at the time, but they were basically conservation-oriented. And he had a terrific record. The other thing he did was institutionalize the environment in the sense that uh, people aren't speaking about the environment in, in their polls and as conscious of it as they used to be. But if somebody comes out, the government comes out with a program that is not pro-environment, it spikes right away again. Just like Nobody's talking about Social Security anymore, but you mess with it and it spikes right away again. So in that sense, he institutionalized it and it's now embedded in our culture. Uh, we're here in Yorba Linda and you mentioned that his, uh, one of his uh, uh, legacies and programs, the legacy, the, the legacy of Parks policy, uh, you, you said sprang, that, that he was really genuinely interested in it and it sprang really from his experience here in Yorba Linda and Whittier as a young man. That's right. Uh, he used to talk about how um, the poor kids in his neighborhood couldn't get in the family car and, and drive to Yosemite or up to Yellowstone, and the parks, quote, needed to be nearer people. And the final result of what we did was to make the, uh, many of the government agencies shed a lot of the land that they owned and uh, make it into parks near, uh, as his policy was, when you have some doubt about this land, there shouldn't be any doubt, turn it into a park. And he created 600 and some parks in the United States that way, including the Gateway East and West in New York City and San Francisco, two of the now largest parks in the country. You were, uh, were you the first director of the Nixon Library? Well, the Nick, I was, I was uh, the first executive director in the sense that I was uh, dealt with Maury Stans, helping to raise the money. I hired the architect. But when we got to the point where we were past the architect and it was time to do construction, the, I was in Washington, D.C., and there was no way I could oversee $27 million worth of construction here, and I got out of it at that point. So I was executive director of a library before it existed. Right. <laughs> were you, uh, so you were present at the coin of phrase, you were present at the creation. Right. Did, uh, do you remember his discussions uh, about what he thought about or uh, who, could you have imagined sitting here in this amazing campus now right. uh, the beginning of its 20th year uh, is this what he envisaged uh, envisaged could he have uh, oh it's hard to answer that question I remember the, the where the land is was the Richard Nixon it was a grammar school and the t it was named after him because he was Yorba Linda's most famous residence and he was vice president of the United States they didn't need the grammar school anymore the enrollments had shrunk down so there was a piece of property and, and the city was able to get it back from the state and it helped us financially because we then had a free piece of land but on top of that and of course what was the clincher is that he was born on this very property so it worked out beautifully. Did you have any major disappointments in terms of uh, what you wanted to accomplish with the, with the environment uh, and the administration? Well, in retrospect, I have disappointments. We missed two issues, acid rain and global warming. Neither one had ever been invented or discussed or we'd heard of it during that time. Uh, and on the acid rain, we cleaned up a lot of sulfur dioxide. Uh, the whole question of global warming and all that is still way up in the air, in my opinion. There's, uh, there's no doubt that uh, it would be good to clean up emissions more to keep cleaning them up, but there is a, a cost and an enormous cost to that. There's an article right now in the papers about EPA making proposals on CO2 cleanup, which run into the hundreds of billions of dollars. And um, as a geologist, I think we've seen many 
climatic cycles that are going to say, no matter how much carbon we emit into the air, we're going to have another glacial period someday, and we're going to have another very hot period one day. You can go in the middle of the Arctic Ocean and find fossil trees this big around that back in the Devonian time, a long time ago in geologic history, uh, was like the Amazon basin right now, all kinds of big hot trees. So all that is so much more important than the question of, you, to use that to justify the CO2 cleanup doesn't, to me, uh, I'm not sure that's scientifically sound. Although I'm probably in a minority in saying that because there's a, a great group that, that feel it's 100% certain that CO2 is going to create damage. My point is that CO2 is not going to create the damage that can be created anyway by changes in global warming, which we don't understand, which are planetary, geologically related. What about the uh, uh, critics or just observers who uh, say that the Nixon, uh, that Nixon's interest in the environment was superficial and or political? And just that. Well, uh, certainly not, not the case in parks. He just loved the parks angle. He used to get his eyes would glaze over once in a while when we get into detail about exactly how clean clean water should be and the economics. And if you move a decimal point just a little bit, it'll cost you another hundred million dollars to, and that sort of thing, and that kind of bottom. So he was not. And then uh, on the political side. He felt, I think, that it was firstly primarily a liberal cause and that there weren't any votes in it for him anyway. And I think he came around to the point of view that this thing has become a mainstream issue and there are votes in it and you've and, and you got, you got to get with it. And he got with it big time. Now to say that was totally, I, I wouldn't say it was totally politically motivated, but it was partially politically motivated, almost like anything presidents do like that. Thank you very much.